Hey, I'm Chris Zeff from Make Everything, and today I'm gonna to show you how I made these Peace and Love bicycle racks out of tube steel. This was a ton of work. Check it out. So for this project, I'm gonna be using two inch by 120 wall tube steel that I got from my local steel supply. And I'm gonna be trying to roll it into these pretty tight shapes using this inexpensive Harbor Freight tubing roller. All right, real quick, before I start working on this thing, for those who will ask, this is a Harbor Freight bender with a swag off-road upgrade kit on it with these wings, this bottle jack section, and then a, a powered drive roller that uses a pipe threader that I also got from Harbor Freight. This is one of the first power tools like that weren't a consumer grade kind of Home Depot style tool that I ever bought. When I first opened the shop, I bought this and my welder and I have rolled hundreds if not thousands of feet of tubing with this thing. Today we're gonna to be trying to make 36 inch and 24 inch circles out of two inch tube. I think it can handle it, so let's get moving. So like I said, this is a pretty inexpensive setup in you know the realm of tubing rollers. And you know even some of the more expensive ones aren't able to manage a two inch tube, especially one with a 120 wall. This is pretty heavy stuff and it doesn't really bend easily. So the way this thing works is that bottle jack is applying downward pressure and then we've got rollers that are not powered, um, but they're just guiding the tubing. And then as I lower that bottle jack by adding some pressure, it's just making that radius tighter and tighter and tighter as I go through it. Now the process takes a little while. It takes about 45 minutes to roll this shape, but you can see once it starts to go, it really starts to move quickly. Um, this is a great way to make incomplete circles, and it's very difficult to make a full complete circle with an equal radius. So this is the first time that I'm trying to do it with material that's this stubborn. I've made rings out of a little more you know, forgiving material, like one by one box tube and stuff that you can really bend by hand. But this stuff put up a serious fight. Uh, it was really difficult to get it out of the bender once I had rolled it around and it sort of met itself on the other side. Once I got it out, I was able to check the radius, check the diameter and see where I wound up. It took a little bit of finessing, but it actually wound up working out pretty well. And I have that tubing bender clamped to my table so it doesn't move. Once I have that shaped on, I bring it over to the table and I actually use the lines in between the plates on this Stronghand Build Pro table as references, which is another really great use of this type of table. You know, layout is so important when you're doing metal work and being able to lay things out geometrically and know that my lines are parallel and square makes a big difference. Now, recently I made this hot work table in my shop. And when I say hot work table, I mean, you know, I don't really want to run a rosebud torch on my nice precision ground build pro table. So this is a piece of three quarter inch plate that's bolted to a frame. And this allows me to heat without worrying about messing up the table. And I can heat and clamp and bend and hammer on material to get it where I want. Now, what I'm trying to do here is close up that gap because I have the offset from rolling the tubing. Now I have a rosebud here um, and I'm heating up that tube and by heating it up, you can actually see if you look closely at the seam that that tubing is moving just from me applying the heat. I had posted a little clip of this on my Instagram a little while ago and here on YouTube where I'm just showing you how I'm able to open and close that ring just by applying heat. It's really amazing how much tension there is in this steel from the bending process and that's actually what I use to my advantage in order to get this bung in place. So this bung is just another piece of tubing that I had that fit inside and I'm able to essentially stretch and then close this gap just by using the heat that I'm applying with the torch on the opposite side. This is gonna be super important for the alignment and just the overall sort of strength of this ring. Now this isn't structural really in any way. Um, there's not really gonna be a huge amount of force on it but I want it to look continuous and I want it to look you know, perfect when it's all done. So I'm trying to get any warps out of this tube if possible. Now what I should have done here is I should have cut this tube uh, on the opposite side from where the other seam is. And I should have been left with two half circles that I could have then corrected. And it would have just made my life a lot easier. I really, really fought with this. I spent a ton of time just trying to correct the warp that was in this tube. And it 
really wasn't so necessary when I would have just saved myself a lot of energy had I just cut the piece of tubing, allowed it to twist a little bit, and then I could have even finessed it with the torch and it would have gone a long way. I'm able to fill the gap in the bottom of this ring with the welder, and then once it's all welded up, I do a little bit more work with the torch, trying to get it squared up and true, um, which again, was kind of a lot of work and maybe not completely necessary. Now that I've got the ring done, I can start planning out the internal lines on this. So this is gonna be a piece sign. So I really need to cut three different sections of tube. One's gonna go vertical, top to bottom, and two are gonna meet it on an angle. Now, since I'm using all the same round tube, I wanna notch that tube in a way that it's going to cope right into the other piece of tubing. Now, right here, I've got a tubing notcher from Stronghand Tools. Now, what this does, is it uses you know a regular hole saw and this arbor and then just a regular drill. And you can see the way that hole saw perfectly is able to cut through the tubing. And that's gonna give me a perfect radius on the edge of that tube that's gonna meet up with the round ring that I've made already. Now with this large of a piece of tube, I'm making sure that I get a lot of really good clamping force on there. And because my hole saw isn't deep enough, I have to cut a little relief out of it with the porta band. What's great about this tubing notcher is it's really easy to get a precise angle by adjusting that block that's over on the side. And you can see I have a couple of test pieces that I had made here that I'm notching so I don't waste too much material. This is just kind of a regular run of the mill hole saw um, and it does an okay job. Like I said, it would be better if it was a deeper hole saw that would allow me to get in there. And I'm actually using a slightly larger size than the tube. I'm using a two and one eighth inch hole saw so that I'm not chewing through too much of the material on the horizontal like I would be if I used an exactly two inch saw. When you're done, you have a pretty nasty burr. So I just take a flap disc and clean it up. Now you can see how quickly I'm able to turn this to a straight cope and I can just notch it using the same setup, but going directly through the tubing. And this is gonna be for where this tube interacts with the rest of the ring. It's a pretty satisfying process, you know, watching the hole saw kind of just chew through the tubing and cut what seems like such a complicated shape in the end of a piece of round tube. Now with one side of this piece of tube notched, I'm able to cut a notch in the other side and I needed to make that slightly undersized because I needed it to be able to fit inside the ring. Once I have those pieces in place, I'm able to mark them and I'm able to notch the other sides of those angled sections, which will then meet to create the piece sign shape that I'm going for. These are nice straight notches, really easy to do. And once I have those angles in place, it's easy to kind of figure these out just with a Sharpie on doing a little bit of measuring. Once I have one completed, then I can transfer that line onto the other one, which I'm basically gonna to go to my short side and do a quick notching operation. Once I have everything laid out, again, you can see how I'm using the parallel lines in the build pro table in order to just sort of aid me in this process. Now it's a little tricky to get this perfect. I wanna make sure this thing looks symmetrical. So I have to cut a little bit of the weld that I made, move some things around and just sort of force things into place. But with the tubing notched, you can really sort of put things where you want them to go and they'll generally stay there um, as opposed to when you're doing, you know, maybe straight tube to straight tube and there's nothing really to register it against. Now I want this thing to look completely continuous uh, like it was cast from a solid piece of material. So I'm doing as, you know, the best job I can to weld these seams really, really well and give myself lots of material to grind back on. I want these to penetrate really well, but I also wanna make sure that I don't have any real big divots that you're gonna notice once I get the grinder in there. Um, there is something really satisfying about grinding around and welding around these sort of curves. And I had a pretty big gap to fill there that I wound up putting a piece of material in just to make sure that everything looked really nice. Once I get all this stuff welded up, There'll be some grinding and there'll be some more welding that I'll have to do just to sort of fill any holes that may have come up along the way. But as I sort of work my way around this piece, I'm trying to kind of keep my heat moving so I don't wind up with any major warping, but just make sure that I hit all the spots, make sure everything is really well welded just so nothing moves around um, and everything looks great once it's all ground out. Now this gap that I was talking about before, I had a little sliver of tube that I welded into there and I just held it in place with a magnet while I filled in around it 
and I'm using O35 wire, which puts a lot of material onto the space and a lot of material down onto your base metal. So you wind up with a lot of stuff you can grind out and I'm definitely good at the grinding part and it makes up for all my shortcomings that I have as a welder. Now with this piece all welded up, I can move it off the bench and get it into a vise so I can see what it looks like. Now onto the second rack. So it's a similar process, but here I have to make two circles and they have to be a much tighter radius. And this is where I was really concerned about this project. So in order to make the heart shape that I'm going for, I need a 24 inch diameter on these rings. Now a 24 inch diameter is really tight for any piece of material, but especially for this two inch tube uh, and on this type of bender. Now I'm really pushing this thing probably to its max, but it's amazing that with you know, a weld together kit and a bottle jack and just, a, you know, a pipe threader, I'm able to bend this material to my whim. You know, it, it's really uh, takes a tremendous amount of force and a, another bender, you know, a professional level, level bender that you would use to do this process would cost tens of thousands of dollars. And I think this setup all in cost me less than a grand. So I get my first 24 inch circle ran and then I start to bend the other one. Now, one of the things that I learned throughout this process was that as I'm bending, it's very helpful for me to cut off those ends um, and allow this circle to get smaller sort of naturally and just lose that little bit of waste. Now, I made sure that I left myself extra material on the outside uh, as I started this bend so that I'd be able to cut pieces off and get tighter and tighter and tighter so I wound up with a nice overlap and I could really make this ring super tight. You know, I very quickly took an eight foot piece of material and turned it into, you know, this pretty small 24 inch ring. Now these don't have to be complete circles because they're gonna be in that heart shape, but the key is that they both need to be of the same diameter. And it's a little tricky with a bender like this, but I think I got extremely close. I'm probably within a quarter of an inch, which is really, really good. And I was very happy with that result. Now laying these out on the build pro table, I can sort of visualize the way the heart is going to come together. And I have some drawings that I had made in SketchUp, but it's a lot different when you get the thing in your hands and you really have to make sure that it looks proportional and doesn't wind up looking funny. Now what I did there was I just cut the seam opposite the gap between the two pieces of tubing. And I noticed right away that this would have solved all my problems when I was making the piece sign. By cutting that piece, I'm able to twist these back into place without having to try to heat them and bend them. And then I just made two holes, one in each piece of the tubing, and I put a bung in there and I plug welded it, which is essentially just filling that hole with some weld. And you can see how nice and flat that tube is sitting on the table. So obviously this was a learning process and I could have definitely saved myself a lot of energy on the first one if I had done this, but you know, the heart was a little more difficult to get to look straight, so I feel like it was a lesson that it was okay to learn. Now I'm using the lines in the table once more to lay out these straight lines that I'll cut over on my bandsaw to make the joint between the two sides of the heart. You don't see me use this bandsaw too often. This is my Powermatic vertical metal cutting bandsaw, but for something like this, it's really great. It's got a nice size table and with a good blade in there, it'll cut perfectly straight and it really is easy for these bigger pieces. Once I have one side cut, I basically just have to trace that angle onto another piece, and then I can cut it again on the bandsaw. The goal is to make these symmetrical and perfect, and by sort of just transferring those lines, working this slowly, taking my time with the bandsaw, I'm able to cut this pretty extreme angle, and there really wouldn't be another great way to do this other than using an angle grinder, which would not be super efficient, you know, something nice about using the bandsaw and creating just small amount of chips. Now with those two halves meeting up, I can start to lay out the bottom section of the heart. Now what's nice about this table is it's got these pins in it so I can use those as a backstop and I can push these two sections up against it so they don't move, center them up on a line and then start doing some measurement and lay out on the table in Sharpie so I can design these lines and make sure they're gonna meet in a way that looks extremely fluid and perfect. 
I use a 2x4 with some lines on it to mark the locations where the joints are going to be on the tubing and where the tubing is going to end on the table. This little porta band comes in such handy in the metal shop. You know, you can just bring it over to your work and its capacity is two and a half inch tube. So it does a great job on the two inch stuff. You can hold it with one hand and really make quick and accurate cuts. I marked my angles here on the table and then I just use this little angle finder to then understand the miter that I was going to need to cut on the bandsaw out of this tube. And then I can bring it over there, cut the angle and lay it back out. Once I have one of them cut, I can put the other one on there and make sure that the angles are going to line up, get everything squared away and cut it and put it in place. I had to add more bungs and more holes so that I can plug weld these pieces together, which I felt would be the most efficient way to join these without having a gap between the two pieces of tubing. The nice thing about the bungs too is it really helps with alignment and once you start welding them into place and you fill those little gaps, it's a really quick and easy way to get tubes to line up before you finish weld around the entire seam. I'm not trying to add any more tension to the piece, but I am just trying to make sure that everything lines up and looks straight before I start welding. So having those bungs in place really helped out. I got one piece welded, I was still able to move it around and do any adjustments I may have needed to and then I can weld the bottom section together. Now the gaps on this were a lot tighter than the gaps that were on the piece sign, so I had to make sure that I burned my welds in pretty well so that I wouldn't wind up just grinding them all out once I got this over to the grinding. The shape turned out really nice and being able to clamp it right down to the table while I was welding it was really helpful. You know, you're introducing a lot of heat into an irreg irregular shape so you can definitely wind up with warping if you don't properly clamp down your pieces of material. Again, I'm making sure I get all sides of this thing. I don't want any gaps or anywhere for there to be water inside the piece. Now getting outside, I get to use one of my favorite products, which is the per Faired Polyfan Curved Disc. This is a perfect application for a disc like this. You've got round shapes and you've got inside corner welds and the curved edge came in such handy on this project. You really can't beat being able to get inside of a curve like that and get inside of a corner. And overall, you know, grinding down these welds was pretty labor intensive, but using high quality abrasives really, really helps. Um, one of my favorite things is the steel heavy grind abrasives from Faird. They make quick work of this kind of stuff. They really get you through your welds and down to your base metal very, very quickly. And since it's a flap disc, there's a little bit of give into it as opposed to using like a fiber disc. And you can really get down into those welds without doing too much damage outside of the weld area. So you're using a combination of different types of discs, the curved discs and other various flap discs. I'm able to grind down all these welds and get myself down, uh, see where I need to add weld and see where I need to kind of fill in little pit holes that may have formed during the welding process. These obviously don't need to hold water, so I'm not trying to do anything, you know, real sanitary or structural. I'm just trying to get these things looking really nice. And there's a couple different tools that I use to do that. This is a pipe burnishing tool. Um, this is a pretty inexpensive one that I got on eBay. And that just helps me sort of clean up different sections of this tubing by wrapping that sandpaper around it. And then I'm using the polyfleece disc, which I talked about in a recent video, which does grinding and polishing in one step to kind of fill those in. I wound up being left with a couple of gaps and a couple of cracks and lines. So I go back and I do welding with my welder set on a slightly lower setting. And I add some material kind of like a metal filler and just sort of grind and weld and grind and weld until I get everything looking really smooth. Back outside, I take that pipe burnisher and I put 120 grit sandpaper on it and I'm able to go around and let that sandpaper sort of wrap around the tubing and really give me a nice finished blended grind. 
and it turns out really, really well. And it's so much faster than trying to do it with a flat abrasive because you wind up with a lot of lines when you do it that way. So now back inside, I want to cut the bottom of the racks so that I'm able to mount these to the base plate. Now with such an irregular shape, it's a tricky thing to do. So I busted out my 360 degree laser. I put it on the table on one of those blocks and I was able to use it to draw lines across these rounded shapes and just follow that laser line around all the way down to the table. And this gives me a perfect reference line that's gonna be perfectly square and I can use that to cut before I mount my base plate. In order to cut these, I just used my porter band. This is the larger of the two that I have. And at first my blade was a little bit dull, so I was cutting a little crooked. But once I switched it out, it made quick work of getting across that piece of tubing. And the same thing went for the heart piece. It's a lot shorter of a cut on that one, but of course I'm trying to make these as square as I possibly can. So there are less gaps to fill with the welder once I get to that stage. Now, once I have the bottoms of these cut, I'm able to lay them out on the plates. These are 12 inch by 12 inch by half inch thick steel plates. Um, I cut these using my metal circular saw, nothing really exciting. And I drilled four holes, one in each corner, and I countersunk them so that I can put security bolts in them. Now getting these jigged up and making sure that the top was level was really important. So I clamped the level up there before I welded it and I held it in place with a magnet. I'm clamping this plate down to the table because I'm introducing a lot of heat right into the dead center. And that's when you have the opportunity for the plate to warp. And the plate is always gonna warp towards the heat. So what happens with a base plate like this when you introduce a lot of heat to it is the corners will peel up like a potato chip. And then when you put it on the ground then you go to bolt it in, you'll wind up pulling the anchors up out of the ground, trying to level out the plate. And it's really, really frustrating. The more clamping pressure you can put on the plate, the better you'll wind up and the less warping you'll wind up with. Once I got those welded down, I hit them with the grinder and got in there with the curve and the heavy flap disc to try to grind down that weld as best I could and really make these things blend into the base plate and look continuous. I used my little pneumatic beveler to get around the base plate to give it a nice finished edge and it worked out super well. If you haven't seen the video on this pneumatic beveler, I did one a couple of weeks ago. It's like an $80 tool and it's really, really awesome. Uh, the other thing that I really like about those curved discs, as you can see there, I'm using the back of it to get into a hard to reach area, which is something you can't do with a normal flap disc, and I really enjoy using them. So one of the things I wanted for the heart is some gussets. And a really quick and easy way to make gussets like this is with a piece of cardboard, you can sort of use a knife or a Sharpie, cut it out, and take some measurements to get the irregular triangle that may be down there. So once I had that, I brought it onto the computer, I designed it over in SketchUp, and I threw it over onto the TorchMate plasma table to cut a nice looking curved gusset with a cutout in the center. And I think that they're a really streamlined sort of look. These would have been a real pain to make without the plasma table. So something like this just sort of adds a little bit of flavor to the part. And it also just makes it so that if somebody leans hard on this thing, I don't have to worry about all of that mass being reliant on a two or three inch weld. I take the beveler and I go around the edges another time just to give myself a really finished look on these and I can put these in place. I'm really happy with the way these gussets came out. I'm able to stick these in and then just get a weld in there. Again, I'm not trying to introduce a tremendous amount of heat, so I was a little cold on the weld, but I think that for the purpose of these things, they're obviously going to penetrate in well enough and they are going to keep this thing very well supported. Now, the last thing I wanted to add was some name plates to these. Now, these are going outside my friend Rob's tattoo shop. So I made a name plate for my shop and a name plate for his shop on Instagram and I welded them down to the base plates of each of the racks. These are going to be outside and they're going to be super bright colors, which are going to catch a lot, a lot of attention. So I wanted to capitalize on that by throwing my Instagram and Rob's two Instagrams on there. And I encourage you to check out his tattoo shop, Solid Gold Tattoo over here in New York, and check out the work that him and his guys do.
Now I was gonna plug weld these on, but since they're so thin, I decided to weld around the edges and then just grind them in with sort of little lines. Um, I tried to space them very evenly and I think that they look really nice. And my whole hope and thought here was that once they were painted, they would sort of blend in, um, but also stand out enough that when people walked by and took a look down, they could you know kind of see who was responsible for putting these cool racks down by the beach. I'm really happy with the way these came out and I had them powder coated. So once all this work was complete, I sent them out to powder coating and they came out fantastic. All right, that about does it for this project. This was a ton of work, super, super challenging, and there is no way I budgeted for enough time when I bid this job, but that's okay, because I learned a tremendous amount throughout the process, and sometimes that's more important than the money you make on a job. So these things, in order to roll these shapes on the tubing roller was very challenging, getting that tight radius, blending everything, but honestly, all said and done, you would think these things were cast um, they look super, super smooth, super continuous, and Justin at On Point Powder Coating did an unbelievable job on the paint. Like I said, we've got this bright pink and this metallic green, and they're just going to look so good outside in the daylight. Um, I can't wait to get them installed. There's a lot of stuff that I went through on this project that will absolutely help me in the future, and that is really, really valuable, and I really like to learn a little bit every time I make something, try to refine my process, and just become better overall. And these are the types of projects where you do become better just by finishing them. So I'm really happy for that. Check out Rob's tattoo shop, Solid Gold Tattoo, and his new shop, Solid Gold Seaside. That's where these are gonna go in Long Beach, New York. If you're in the area and you wanna get a tattoo, check them out. They're a great shop and Rob is a great guy. These were his idea um, and I just executed them and I'm really, really happy with the way that they turned out. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you wanna see what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis here in the shop, check me out right here at Make Everything Shop. I pretty much post every day on my Instagram, sharing what I'm doing and answering questions along the way. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. If you like this video and you wanna see more stuff like this, subscribe to my channel and you can check out more videos where I'm gonna be fabricating things, giving tool tips and doing all sorts of fun stuff. I've got a really cool project with the tubing roller that I think is gonna be a lot of fun uh, that involves a ATV motor, the tubing roller, and some motorcycle tires. So you'll have to stay tuned and see what that one's gonna be. And just a bunch of really cool projects coming up that I hope you're there to watch. Again, I'm Chris Zephyr Make Everything. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you on the next one.